In this lecture, we will discuss as a part of continuous that discussion we are carrying out over the last couple of lectures that is environment impact assessment. This will be part 5 and in this uh, lecture we will talk about the various considerations for environment impact assessment. Now, if you just uh, recall that in the previous lecture we were talking about a different methodology. We talked about hedonic prices, cost benefit analysis and so on and so forth of various methods of environment impact assessment analysis. Now, in this lecture let us see that what are the various considerations that before if anyone wants to go for EIA. Friends, another thing I would like to mention here, EIA could be a potential career options for many people who are working in the field of environmental sciences or natural resource management, biodiversity and so on and so forth. So, EIA offers also good uh, professional opportunities as well as entrepreneurships also. So, I think that in this field particularly in, in the field of natural resource management, EIA offers uh, quite a lot if it is you know learnt in an appropriate manner and then followed by little bit of professional training. So, the considerations if we see that we have mainly two sets of consideration. One is scientific consideration where we need to check the accuracy and prediction and also explain the errors. So, accuracy of the information data analysis and also to minimize the error that is what is the first consideration under scientific consideration. Second is management considerations. Here it is to assess the success of mitigation in reducing impact. Okay? So, here we actually mainly look at the various mitigation plans and their implementation and how much they are actually you know successful to reduce the impact of you know various environmental uh, activities that is being carried out in the field of natural resource management. So, if you take these two consideration basically help you to proceed towards sustainable development. Now, there are various other aspects if you recall in the first uh, lecture of EIA part 1 we discussed about uh, you know that legal policy and institutional framework are also heavily involved into that. So, today we will discuss in detail about these aspect. Now, if you look at uh, you know EIA in international environmental law context, it is actually a vastly read and research subject across the world. And if you see that convention on environmental impact assessment in a transboundary context. Now, this convention ESPO convention, this sets out the obligations of the various parties to assess the environmental impact of their certain activities at an early stage of planning. All right? And this convention also lays down the general obligation of states country to notify and consult each other on all major projects under consideration that are likely to have significant adverse environmental impact across the border. So, I am here in Assam northeastern part. So, I can give you immediately one example of such nature is that if any kind of say a uh, dam you plan on, on river Brahmaputra in the upstream. So, naturally across the country, the country who, who are actually located in the upstream of, of Brahmaputra, the country or countries who are in the middle and low stream of Brahmaputra need to sit together, need to talk with. Now, you all know that Brahmaputra starts from where passes through almost entire course of northeast and then it goes into Bangladesh. So, there are couple of country and various states within our country involved. So, important is that all parties come together, sit together, discuss and find out a way which will have less and least impact on the environment across the border, the state borders and also the international border. 
Next, another policy or legal or institutional framework in the history of environment is Rio Declaration, 1992. All of us, we are aware of that, that there are 17 principles under Rio Declarations, which actually on environment and development. And that's Rio Declaration called for EIA as a national decision making instrument. 1992, it was decided that environment impact assessment analysis has to be carried out by every country. And EIA will be used in assessing whether any proposed project are likely to have significant adverse impact on your environment or not. So see, 1992, almost 30 years back, this has been already brought into effect. Now, the famous Agenda 21, it also, you know, talk about this. It also introduced appropriate EIA procedures for proposed projects. Nobody is telling that you don't go for project, you don't, you stop project, no. But the point is that before you start any project, it is must that you carry out an impact analysis. And if you see that it is, it is going to impact heavily on environment, then you modify it. There is opportunity to modify. Because once any impact takes place on environment, it is almost irreversible. You cannot take it back. So, under this context, EIA is legally also an important aspect. See, after your Rio Declaration, then come UN Convention on Climate Change and Biological Diversity, same year, 1992. Actually, 1972, Stockholm, 1992, Rio, these are the year, no, these are, these are the critical year in the history of human civilization because those are the event where the entire world reached there to express concern about the environment. So, United Nations Convention on Climate Change, Biological Diversity, these also cited EIA as an implementing mechanism. So, you can see that internationally, how United Nations and every other country is giving importance on EIA. Next, Doha Ministerial Declaration 2001, that also encourages countries to share expertise and experience with the members, encouraging them to perform environmental reviews at their national level. So, there is a constant process, constant encouragement to carry out EIA was there and it is still there. UNECE, this convention on access of information, public participation in decision making and access to justice on environmental matters. This also covers the decision at the level of project and its planning, program, policies, etc. And there also EIA comes in. United Nations Conference on the Environment, as I said, the famous 1972 Stockholm, that was perhaps the, you know, beginning when the entire world community understood that something is going wrong in our environment, in the natural resource domain. So, that was the time that most of the head of the country, they spoke in single, you know, voice, that we must save our environment. Next, UN Convention on Climate Change and Biological Diversity, that also cited EIA as important. So, next is EIA Multilateral and Bilateral Financial Mechanism to Safeguard Environment. Now, many countries have come forward and actively participate, whereas same were little bit slow for various reasons. Now, African Development Bank ADB, Asian Development Bank, EBRD, European Investment Bank, Japanese Bank of International Cooperation, JBIC, World Bank, these are key players internationally working on environmental impact assessment, legal policy and institutional frameworks, development, implementation, helping, you know, developing countries to maintain and manage the resources, natural resources that they have, implementing, you know, mechanisms for managing environment. So, these are the key players and I am sure that you are all aware of these uh, banks 
actually who give all sometime loans sometime also some help to various countries now how in the case of national legislations and international institutional framework to work with respect to eia national legislations in any country may include a statutory requirement for eia to be done and in a prescribed manner for various development activities most legislation list projects for which eia is a mandatory requirement now again there are few countries few nations where even though eia is such a strong tool such a strong uh, tool which is legally almost bound yet in some cases this is not being followed all of us we are aware of that so it is important that this is you know strictly uh, maintained so that you know the first very first you know step of a new project implementation is cross checked with regard to its impact on our environment institutional framework if you look at eia institutional system it varies from country to country because in different country you have different type of governance the way india government you know indian system works it may not be same in another country bangladesh nepal or bhutan in some countries you will find either ministry of environment or designated authority or some planning you know administ planning agency administers eia in other cases it may work in a different way environment issues also often involve many disciplines as we know science engineering arts everything comes in it's a pure interdisciplinary field many government bodies with general environmental and resource management laws also are involved in eia now we will look into the uh, various processes eia processes which help us to implement all these things that i have been sharing or discussing with you over couple of lectures so we will see that how eia process basically try to implement these different methodologies different frameworks that i have discussed in the previous lectures the first phase of an environmental assessment in environment impact assessment framework is called initial environmental examination or i double e and the second is environmental impact study that is eis or simply detail is eia okay i e e initial environmental examination from the name itself i think it is a little bit clear to you what it is doing and the second one is environment impact studies now together the entire package we call as eia or environment impact analysis now these two key process let us see how it works i e e is carried out to determine whether potentially adverse environmental effects are significant or not very clear ie is carried out to determine whether the potentially adverse environmental effects are significant or not this also contains brief statement of key environmental issues based on readily available data information and those will be used in the primary stage preliminary phase of the project planning okay third when an initial environment examination is taking place that will be able to provide a definite solution to environmental problems and eia is probably not necessarily if at this stage it is taken care of okay so on the other side eia or eis suppose you want to go eis is a procedure which is used to examine the environmental consequences or impact both beneficial or adverse of any proposed plan of a development project okay eia or eis per se is based on predictions it's kind of a you know early warning system for environmental management the study or analysis therefore 
it requires a multidisciplinary approach because there you will have the scientific processes involved for environmental different impact, impact on society, technological solution for mitigation. So, see science, technology, society, everything will come into picture for a proper environment management. So, in other words, a project should be assessed for its total environmental feasibility and that you can do through this uh, second process EIS. Now, I E E I E E plus E I S gives you a package which we call as E I A. All right. Now, this E I A process uh, in India, it goes through different different route and different different processes. As I said that every different country could have different pathways of implementations of carrying out EIA. Environment impact assessment notification in India was carried out in the year 2006 and 2006 totally decentralized the environment of Kriyanes project by dividing the development projects into two categories. Now, the first category, category A of development projects is national level appraisal, where you will do the appraisal or the analysis at the national level. Second category of development project, you will have state level appraisal, clear? So, it has been decentralized because our country is such a big country. Now, if you do the central, you know, from the center, all those states, it becomes uh, difficult because you have certain projects uh, between two states also impact because state borders are there. And I do not want to mention many of you are for different parts of our country from different states. Each one of you may be knowing with river, with forest, with fertile land, we have many, many issues between our different states. So, it is that is why divided or decentralized into two categories. Category A where you need national appraisal, you cannot compromise, it has to be national level and the other one it can be state level. Now, the first category that is category A projects generally are appraised at the national level by impact assessment agency IAA and the expert appraisal committee that is EAC. All right. So, category A, the national level appraisal will be carried out by two agency. One is impact assessment agency that is IAA and the second is the expert appraisal committee that is EAC. Both of these are two institutions requires mandatory environmental clearance and thus they do not undergo the screening processes. Category B project are appraised at the state level. Now, state level environment impact assessment authorities or SEA or state level expert appraisal committee SEAC are constituted to provide clearance to category B process. They undergo the screening process and they are classified again into two types. Category B1 type of project which mandatorily requires EIA. So, category B1 project under category B must have EIA. Category B2 projects EIA is not mandatory. So, this particular slide has lot of information for all of you, right. So, project categorizations is very clear cut. EIA at the national level when it is carried out, we call it category A development project and we call category B development project when state level appraisal takes place, right. So, at the central level at the category A type of analysis, you have two different agency, central agency taking care of that. At the state level category B projects, you have different agency at the state level, all right. Now, an example of a World Bank, you know, EIA process. World Bank has criteria for screening projects in different way. You remember that a uh, couple of minutes back we discussed about that how different banks like these are the banks which are actually involved for various kind of EIA framework or legal policy institutional framework. 
So, here to just you know explain to you that how the process EIE processes work, I just taken one example of World Bank. Now, World Bank has couple of criteria, category A. Here, the projects are likely to have significant environmental impacts, they will be clubbed under category E, whichever project, whichever project the expert committee, they feel that these are the projects which may have significant impact on the environment, they are sensitive to the society. So, then they will be clubbed under category A. These impacts of this kind of projects which World Bank screen under category A, these impacts may affect an area broader than you know the communities benefiting from the infrastructure in or investment. What does that mean? Means the projects which comes under category A, they may have much more environmental impact in comparison to the benefit that what they are going to get from the development project. So, certainly there is an issue, then you need to think whether I need this kind of so called development project which basically in going to impact me much more negatively. So, my profit is benefit is low and loss is high, then why should we go for that kind of thing right. So, that is you know category A. Category B, if the projects potentially has adverse impacts on human population or environmentally you know sensitive or important areas and if they are less adverse than the category A projects, it will come under category B. Now, these impacts are very much site specific, okay? very much site specific. Suppose say that uh, you know you carry out a development project, you are bringing an industry or suppose you are building a, a water harvesting structure in an area, where suppose you have very, very environmentally sensitive biomedicinal plant population, very rare. And suppose that that biomedicinal plant populations is nurtured by a particular community and they are doing it for hundreds, hundreds of years. You can imagine the amount of value, social value, community value attached to that population of plant, biomedicine plant. It is not only the uses of that, but there is also a social value attached to that. And if suppose a development project comes in and effect going to affect that, that effect will be site specific, but it will have an effect on human population. So, that kind of project will come under category B. Clear? Now, next is category C. If the project is likely to have minimal or almost no adverse environmental impacts, they will come under category C. And once the project is assessed, analyzed and determined as category C, no further action would be required. So, that means the project can go ahead. Category C projects may include education type of projects. Suppose you want to build a school or a college, capacity building type of project, family planning type of project. So, these are the projects categorized screen under category C and if once they come under category C, then you actually go ahead with the project. Now, let us see the different phases of EIA process. Friends, again I am telling that I am going a little slowly step by step of this EIA topic because it is very, very critical for you know professionals who are going to take you know natural resource management or environment or, or sustainability, this kind of area field, EIA is one of the key tool and uh, your own professional capacity uh, building must include EIA process or EIA tool learning. Now, the phases of EIA processes are screening, scoping, baseline data collection, impact analysis and prediction, analysis of alternatives. You see, if you can recall that all this topic in one or other aspect we have discussed, touched upon. Okay? Now, these are different phases of EIA. You start from here and go step by step. Next, mitigation and impact management, environmental management plan EMP, environmental monitoring 
environmental impact statement EIS, decision making, finally effective EIA follow up. So, this is the EIA process that normally is followed in the field of impact assessment analysis. Now, this graphical figure will give you an idea about the entire paradigm of EIA process. Now, first suppose there is a development project is proposed by government or any agency per se. Now, first when the proposal is submitted, there will be suppose two or three proposals, you first screen them, which are the proposals comes under which category. Now, just now we discussed like category A, B, C. Then you carry out an initial environmental examination IEE, which is also part of EIA. That will tell you that whether you need to go for EIA or not. Just now we discussed right that in World Bank follows a process where if it goes to category C, then no further EIA is required, the project can be allowed to go ahead. Then you have scoping to look at that how that particular proposed project, whether that proposed project has any impact or not. So, you go for impact analysis, then you go for mitigation and impact management. If you find that yes, this has some impact. Once analysis done, you go for EIA report and then it goes, this report goes to certain concerned officers or ministry, then decision making takes place. Decision taking making means it will either approved or not approved, cancel the project. If it is approved, then you go for finally implementation and follow up. So, this is the total process of EIA that is being taken care of. Mm -hmm.